Good morning. It's Thursday, October 9th, 2014. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 73. My name is Chris, but that doesn't matter because right next to me is this mumble room. And in this mumble room, I have assembled an amazing team of internet experts. Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. With have a good evening. Evening. Hello. Hello. Hey, 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 oh. hey, hey. Whoa. Whoa, that was pretty good, guys. That was pretty good. I liked that. Uh, so let's start with the big thing that happened a little bit after we went off the air yesterday, HTC's big fashion show. I, I mean, uh, phone announcement. Uh, HTC, HTC has a new phone they want you to know all about, the Desire Eye. It's going to be a mid-range phone, the company says, but it has a few interesting things about it. Finally, one selfie phone to rule them all. Uh, it ha- that's its biggest feature, a forward-facing 13 megapixel camera. Of course, it also has the dual LED light. It also, they have the same camera on the back. 13 megapixel up front, 13 megapixel in the back. Oh yeah, party up front and party up back. It also shoots 1080p video and it has a 5.2 inch 1080p display, which has good wide viewing angles, they say. It has the Qualcomm Snapdragon 801 processor paired with two gigabytes of RAM, just like the HTC's uh, new M8 uh, for the HTC One. And it has a plastic finish instead of all metal, like the HTC One or the iPhone 6. Now, here's a couple other neat things it does. It's like Photoshop in your pocket. Uh, So it's got this mode where it can take a picture with both the front and rear camera at the same time. Uh, They call it front back mode, which is adorable. And it uses what they should just call gimmick mode, but it's you can insert yourself into the scene (laughs) using both cameras. So you take a picture of the background with your back rear camera, you take a picture of your face with the forward facing camera, and then (laughs) really it goes into gimmick mode and you can move yourself around in the scene of the picture you took with the rear facing camera like you couldn't. Good lord. Right. (laughs) <laughs> I can do this that with my the idea I've ever heard. I, 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 fact, I figured out what it's for. What is, is this for when you're taking pictures of your family or something? Oh, maybe. Yeah, I guess oh. you could do that. So uh, HTC's what? example on stage was you could put yourself in your friend's pocket. What? That's what they said, dude. No, that's, that's you can just put phone. just put that's yourself right phone. put yourself in the pocket right there. Just put yourself yeah. in their pocket. That's for the NSA. In the back. So I, it is kind of a fun feature. I mean, it's not horrible, horrible. And, you know, uh, we're talking like this is their mid-range device. So it, <laughs> this is something that this is this is something they can put on the box to sell to consumers when they go into the cellular store and they're looking for their phone. Uh, it's it's obviously not going to be a feature once you get it home. You're probably going to use too much. But how come? Uh, okay, why is why is it taken until now to finally get a decent front facing camera? And I'm not Mr. Selfie over here, but I'll often take pictures of my kids with the front facing camera because they move so fast that it's easier just to stick the camera in front of their face where I can see the screen and then pull the trigger when I have a good picture. And I use that's much easier for me to maneuver with the front facing camera than it is for me to maneuver with the rear facing because it's I totally. I, agree yeah i totally agree because it, they need to have higher quality on that front facing camera for that very reason and also i mean what does it take to put a different chip in there really right a different sensor chip in there that has higher resolution here's it a bit take much here's a bit of a here's a bit of a disappointment uh in the verges tests that 13 megapixel front facing camera took worse pictures than the iphone 6 is like two megapixel camera in low light so I don't know well, what's that makes up. Makes sense. It's not. It's not going to be the best sensor, even though it's going to have higher resolution. I suppose. Yeah, true. I suppose. True. But isn't that the whole point? <laughs> you know. I think the reason why the phone has um, not a lot of phones have a good face, front uh, facing cameras because the one on the front has to be smaller than the one on the back. Right, and it's cost too, right? Because it's a screen. Yeah. Well, cost too, right? I mean, because it's these things yeah. are, you know, they're tight margins on some of these. Uh, so anyways, I'm a big, I, I really want to mention this because I'm a really big HTC build quality fan. I think the HTC One was the best built Android phone I've ever owned. I it, My Nexus 5 has surpassed it in some ways, but in some ways the HTC One is a superior phone. Now, the main thing, I know it sounds silly, the thing I really, really like about my HTC One is those front-facing speakers. It makes a huge difference if, you know, you're listening to a podcast. You, you essentially don't need a sound bar or, like, a, a dock to put the phone in or anything like that because the front-facing speakers were so great. And, and because they were separated across the whole device, you actually had a little stereo separation, too. Not, not an amazing amount, but enough that it was the best-sounding device I've ever owned. Unfortunately... The new Desire Eye doesn't have the front-facing speakers that HTC is kind of classic for on the One. So it's just got the standard old phone speaker. But 
But this is why God invented Bluetooth. Yeah, I know. But see, the nice thing about the HTC One is you don't need any of that stuff because it's all in the phone. You can watch video, oh, podcasts. Okay, you know, you don't need any external speakers. You don't need to hook it up to nothing. It's all loud enough and sounds good enough, too. That was the other thing is it had good mids and all that. Uh, so HTC didn't just stop, though. We, we There's other things to talk about than just their camera. They also introduced something that... It, it looks like a periscope in a sense, but it is actually an HTC standalone camera. They call it the Re camera. It's a periscope shaped camera, like I mentioned. It has a it has uh, some interesting features though. Number one, it can continuously record all the time if you want. It connects to your smartphone. It's to be it's considered a smartphone accessory, not a uh, standalone camera. It has a uh, f 2.8 lens with an ultra wide 146 degree angle of view. It has 16 megapixel CMOS sensor. The sensor is bigger than what you'd find in a smartphone, in, at least in most smartphones. The reconnect connects to your the re sorry it's just the re and then re camera or just re <laughs> the re connects to your smartphone via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Two different things. Wi-Fi for the high bandwidth stuff, Bluetooth for the keep alive. It works with Android or iOS later this year. And uh, once it's connected, you can control the camera, view and transfer content, and change the settings with the app on your smartphone. You can also set up things like time lapse, take a series of photos over time, all that kind of stuff. It has a tripod mount on the bottom. It uses micro USB for charging. It has a micro SD slot. It comes with 8 gigs included, but it can go up to 128 gigs. And HTC pitches the Re as more of a lifestyle camera like Polaroid's Cube than a rugged action cam, but it can go underwater uh, for up to 30 minutes, 3.3 feet for, for up to 30 minutes. So if you drop it in something or it gets rained on, I, <clears throat> maybe it's the... Uh, maybe it's the podcaster in me going to like uh, cons and stuff like this, but this actually... Kind of has a seems like seems like it could serve a purpose for me. Uh, it's, I I agree. And it, you know, yeah. if, and I like that yeah. it works with any phone too, not just HTCs. Yeah, yeah that's no. a huge selling point. The other thing I was thinking of was I saw in my uh, Google Plus feed a lot of people making fun of it, and I don't know why. It sounds like a good idea. Yeah, here's why but, I like it because you know, for one, it would put the battery drain on this instead of my smartphone. Exactly. And if, if I'm at a convention, that keeps my smartphone available, which is already disastrous for phones because of the cellular situation. Uh, and I like, uh, I'm the thinking storage. like, well, yeah, right. That's really nice too. So I could take it around and just leave my phones resting. But I, I'm also picturing this like, what if, you know, for a Jupiter Broadcasting production, Google Hangouts or Skype on the phone, this is the camera for that. And we could be walking around a convention floor, shooting live footage, piping it back to a phone that has an LTE or Wi-Fi connection that's live streaming it. And it could oh. be a good looking picture, right? That I think it's interesting. Now here, okay. So here's. Here's maybe the rub. What do you guys think about this price? So they're saying it's going to be uh, late October. $7, no, no, not that much. <laughs> Early November-ish is probably when we're going to see this, and definitely mid-November-ish for the UK. 199 US dollars. So it's about maybe 160 to 170 uh, euros, but 199 US for this thing. And you have to have a smartphone to work with it, right? It doesn't I don't believe. I'm not sure, but I don't believe it works really without a smartphone. But, okay, wait, that price is for the quote-unquote re? Like, yes. that's the actual camera thing? Okay, 199 you know, bucks. Yeah, you know, that's 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 great if you want. I mean, one of my things about my, my, my actually good camera is that it doesn't have Wi-Fi. I mean, like, if it had Wi-Fi, it'd be awesome. Yeah, this is this seems like, um, this is like that. See, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that uh, my only camera is my smartphone right now, and that's inexcusable, really. But anything I could do to make that a little better is maybe what's appealing to me because I'm not <clears> – <throat> it's like what you just said, Seth. Uh, the stuff just isn't – the high-end stuff isn't what – doesn't have everything I want yet to justify spending that money. And I feel like yeah. once an amazing camera that has all of that stuff I want, like it talks to my smartphone and all of that is there, which it probably will be eventually, then that seems like the time to pull the trigger. But this could be like a stopgap in the meantime until I'm ready to get that DSLR or whatever that needs you know lenses and all that stuff. Yeah, I could totally. play with this stuff. And, and 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 it does actual video and stuff. Yeah, it does a 1080p video. So no way, that's, that's pretty actually slick. pretty awesome. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, it's interesting at least, if nothing else, to see HTC. And I wonder if we'll see uh, things that only work with your cell phone as a category that explodes. Like we're seeing it with the smartwatches <laughs> now, right? And now we're seeing, you know, of course, Bluetooth headsets have already been a thing that you pretty much only use with your smartphone. So it seems like the categories have already been proven out. It's just what devices could they expand upon? My sense tells me this is going to be a market flop. So how does it 
connect to the actual phone, like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth? So Bluetooth uh, and Wi-Fi are both used. Uh, when the when you're not actively using it, it switches into Bluetooth LE just to kind of do a keep alive because it's it's an extension of your phone's camera functionality. So the, right. it needs to kind of be there. And then when you're when you're trans when you're live like so when you're like using it as a viewfinder on your smartphone and you're you're getting a live picture from the camera, that transfer is over Wi-Fi. And I I don't know the specifics. But on more recent versions of Android and I think iOS since like six, uh, you can do you know direct to direct uh, Wi-Fi connections. You don't have to have you know you can do ad hoc. You don't have to have a central base station. They don't have to be on your Wi-Fi network per se. They could have their own Wi-Fi channel. They're direct communicating over. Okay, I was kind of curious about that because it seems like Sony has had something like this for a while, which is kind of like a lens that attaches to your phone and goes over Wi-Fi back to your phone to give you the image. Yeah. So it, it just seems like it's a uh, different, I would say a poor man's version of that, but at the same time, it's the same price. Does it like have local storage or does yes. it s- yes. store it to eight the comes, phone? It comes with eight gigs as a micro SD card slot. You can go up to 128 gigabytes. And can nice. it work alone or does it have to be connected at all times? Or can you just like snap, 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 and then go home and check it out? I'm not sure. You know, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not. I'm not so sure. I think it does but, do some limited. They've only they've only teased us details. It, they say it requires a smartphone, but since it has local storage, you, I would be willing to bet it could snap offline. Yeah, totally. I mean, like if if it, if it uses micro SD, I mean, you should be able to theoretically pop them in, pop them out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. Uh, okay. All right. Well, we've got a massive, massive, massive 157, or I'm sorry, 159 security vulnerabilities patched by Google today, and some of them include remote code execution exploits. Before we talk about that, I want to mention the Patreon page, which you guys are, you know what, 361, you guys are awesome. 361, this is great. This this is awesome. Thank you so much, everyone who's going over to patreon.com slash today and helping us bump that up. We're trying to get to a goal of 400 patrons before the end of October when we take off to go to Ohio Linux Fest and we'd stalled out initially. I'm a little worried that we've now that we've seen a good response, we're going to stall out again. Uh, so what is this page? You probably know now if you listen to the show for a little while. Patreon.com slash today is where you can go to help invest in the Jupiter Broadcasting Network to give us the room to budget, to plan, and to try new things, but also to just keep it a little weird, keep it more aligned to our audience and less to commercial interests and things like that. And that's going to be even more critical as the Jupiter Broadcasting Network grows. And we were before we launched the Patreon page for Tech Talk today... We were really kind of up against a hard choice. Like, we know where we needed to go. We know what we needed to do. And our, our main two options were really, okay, we'll just take a really, 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 really long time to get there. Slow but steady over a course of several years. Which the problem is, is that's that sort of, I could see there's there's some logic and, and, and a good reason to go that route. But there's also, in the age of the internet, a, a huge disadvantage to moving that slowly. In fact, I would say it, it, you, it, it could ruin a, a company if they move that slowly. The other option would be to double down on advertising and increase the advertising slots in our shows, um, especially maybe the popular ones. And, and then, you know, that would be a, a fantastic way to, to raise revenue. But we really have always, always, always worked to make sure that we walk that content to advertising balance. Um, you know, we really, that's something that <clears throat> we don't talk about a lot except for right now, uh, and it's something that's a, it's a major thing that we've constantly been turning away advertisers, especially for some of uh, our more established shows, uh, for a long time now. And it's really a weird thing to do as somebody who needs money and needs to grow the business and has things he has to invest in, but at the same time has to respect that it's about the content. That's that's where Patreon has moved the dial for us. It's, it's changed the conversation. It's no longer we either constrain ourselves to something that could eventually lead us to a slow death or we sell out. It is now we we can the audience interests and our interests can be completely aligned. We can we can we can grow not maybe as fast, but we can still invest and grow and and try out new things. We have budget and predictability, and we answer to our audience. And that's that's what Patreon.com/slash today is. And this show Tech Talk today, I launched this as just something I can try to do to say thank you every day for all of you out there. 361 of you who are investing in the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. And I would love to get that up to 400 people by the end of October. Patreon.com slash today. If you enjoy a couple of the Jupiter Broadcasting shows, that's a great way to make sure they get on the air. And we're always working on new stuff. And a lot of times when you when you launch a new show, you have to launch it without advertising. Not always, but sometimes you do because it has to prove itself out. That means that's, that's all out of pocket that entire time, all of that cost. And 
with Patreon's system, and, and specifically the Tech Talk Today Patreon, we can allocate some of those funds to help just take that edge off even. It doesn't pay for all of it, but it just makes it possible. It, it makes it possible. And that's, I am so grateful for all 361 of you. Patreon.com slash today. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we started to get the first batch of stickers last night. I got home from Unfilter. They were on Angie's desk. They look awesome. Very excited. So the Swag Club members will be getting those soon. Okay, let's talk about these Google flaws that came out. 159 security vulnerabilities that were patched by Google this morning. You think it sounds like Windows all of a sudden. And here's the best part. Only in Chrome. These are just Chrome vulnerabilities. Just in Chrome. Uh, and it's kind of it's kind of cool in a sense because it shows you that some of Google's uh, public initiatives to find to have people find bugs are working. And I'll tell you more about that here in a second. But here you go. So in total, we're talking 159 security vulnerabilities that are patched. New version of Chrome came out this morning. Chrome uh, is, uh, you know, sort of self-updating, so you don't really have to worry about that too much. Google noted that it also made 113 relatively minor fixes on top of the 159 major security vulnerabilities that it found in its open source memory sanitizer application alone. Yeah. Uh, so here's, a, here's the neat part. As part of these security updates, Google is paying out $75,000 in bug <laughs> bounties. Yes. So this is wow. le- this is legit. Uh, nice. The top award, twenty-seven thousand dollars, paid to Zari Andele for a <laughs> vulnerability discovered in CVE 2014-3188. That vulnerability could have led to remote code execution triggered by a number of bugs in Google's V8 JavaScript engine and their inter-process communication functionality, the IPC functionality inside Chrome. Massive, massive. So you know the headline is 159 security fixes. But then there's also, on top of that 159 security fixes, about 113, exactly. there's, there's 113 relatively minor ones. So, mumble room. Is Chrome gotten too big? Remember how Chrome was that lean, mean, optimized WebKit browser by Google? Now Chrome offers things like remote desktop functionality, uh, Google Now integration. Now when I install Chrome, I get Hangouts automatically up in my... Uh, menu bar because I have the top icons extension in, in GNOME, so I have to look at the Hangouts icon all the time. Chrome's up there. It auto-starts with my system. Uh, is is this... It, it, we are talking 159 major security vulnerabilities and 113 relatively minor So in one update. Big, yeah. The, the big thing here is that Chrome, you know, as much as everyone remembers, like, oh, I've had that for a while, it really isn't that old comparatively to say, look at its biggest competitor, Firefox. When you go and you look at it, and it's like Firefox has been around for almost twenty some years now. Yeah. And yeah. then you go and look at Google Chrome, and they, they go and it's like they've made their own JavaScript engine, they've made all this other stuff, and they've made it in a really short time. So I'm not really that surprised that there are some bugs there that sure. haven't been hashed out with some time. And it, it seems like uh, so Google is adding stuff super fast to stay competitive. I mean, you can just look. This is version 38 of Chrome, right? It's nuts. Um, and uh, they're adding a ton of stuff, you know, like the offline Chrome stuff, the ability to run Android apps, all of this junk. But at the same time, like they at least are doing sort of a responsible thing. They obviously have a very functional bug bounty program that is delivering not just like okay results, but amazing results. I mean, they paid out $75,000 in bug bounties for this. It's amazing. Yeah. So browsers, uh, browsers tend to do a very good job of this. Actually, uh, Mozilla does this quite often with their, with actually all their suites. But uh, mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. believe it's coming up this year in a couple months now. I do, I do wonder though if maybe it's getting a little too big. It's getting a little too much stuff. There's too much going on with Chrome. You know, I've noticed those downloads are like what 100. Like when I downloaded Chrome the other day, I think it was 100. And, 15 megabytes, I want to say. It was pretty big. I don't remember, but I was shocked at how large a single application could be. Uh, these I, are all arbitrary things, but I just wonder if maybe it's a sign that it's getting too com- too complex. I use Lynx. <laughs> there yeah. you go. I, Midori, I, I up stopped here. for a while ago. I, 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 find, I find nowadays Firefox is actually faster than Chrome. Isn't it weird? Mm. I agree. What I've been using about? Firefox for a while. I stopped are, using Chrome because it's just so bloody. I've used Chrome for the longest time, but I find it slows down computers a lot. Sure, yes. I, I, okay, so here's my take on this. Uh, Firefox, if you're on Linux, is the better browser. Uh, it just looks better, it scrolls better, the fonts look better. 
But Chrome is, in my opinion, when you have multiple tabs and stuff going on, Chrome itself is more responsive, but Chrome itself can also, seems like it puts a heavier load on the whole computer. It is, right? It, you can you can just watch the CPU cores and you can see how. But I, I actually find on, a, on multi-core systems and with SSDs and all that kind of stuff, I find Chrome to be the faster browser to use and it keeps making me switch back because Firefox, like if something's going weird in Firefox, sometimes I have the whole UI leg out in Firefox. And that's when the whole UI becomes unresponsive, I'm, I'm out. And I don't really have that happen much in Chrome. So I, 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 but I bounce between them. Like I almost always, I have like Firefox open for some stuff and Chrome open for other stuff. And I'm using both browsers. And then I often will even have like Midori. And I'll be using Midori for like my my mm. one of my Google accounts or something. You just described exactly what's on my computer yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. It's like there's not one browser that does all. Um, so oh, you know what? Oh, this makes sense. Okay, so October sixteenth. You guys, do you guys know what's happening next week, Thursday, October sixteenth? Are you super excited? Are you all anticipatory? Because Apple has announced it's been way too long. And that was actually their announcement. Um, and with a little side note that they'll be having an event on October 16th, believed to be about iPads and Macs. We don't actually fully know. The The real hint is that it's been way too long. They have a colored Apple logo. I think, depending on the time, we might cover it live here on the show. It's, you know, one of these things. It's going to be an iPad, I'm sure. I am... Who knows? I just uh, we'll we'll just programming note. Expect uh, Tech Talk today to cover this live on October sixteenth. If they do it in the morning, otherwise we'll pick it up. Uh, oh yeah, they're gonna do it at ten a.m. Pacific time. So maybe what we'll do on Thursday is we'll do the show one hour later. We might start the pre-show at the regular time for next Thursday, but we'll actually go live at ten and probably go for a little bit and cover it live and then release it. Are you going to need an in-studio co-host? Sure, sure. Yeah, you, you're more than welcome to join me. <laughs> Well, I'll probably have to. Okay. All right. Very good. So Eric will be in studio and we'll do live coverage. So I would expect, my my expectation is you're going to see an iPad with Touch ID. You're going to see Yosemite launched. My question for you, Mumble Room. The rumor is an iPad Pro 12-inch screen is coming. Anybody want to take a shot, Take it. want to go out on a limb, make a Red Book prediction. Are we going to see a 12-inch iPad unveiled next Thursday? I would love one. Would you? Would you be interested in that? Of course, yeah. The only reason I use my iPad is for this one particular app called Sketch Club, which is like a photo. Sh- it's like a Adobe Illustrator replacement that is awesome. And I, more screen real estate I can get off of it, it's great. Well, and, you know, people have been saying, oh, my iPhone is so big or my, my Note is so big, I don't even use my tablet anymore. Um, I'm a little more skeptical. Yeah? And, and the reason is because I've had a iPad-sized tablet before, and my gosh, the thing was heavy and a lug to carry <laughs> around a lot. And I love my 8-inch tablet because it seems like it's the perfect size for me. But the 12-inch tablet, all I, all I pretty much use it for is powering you, the Chromecast. Wait, you have a 12-inch tablet? Oh, I'm sorry, not a 12-inch. It's a 9 Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, damn, son. You know, uh, I've noticed... Gigantic. So my son, uh, Dylan, when he was younger, really, really, I would say, preferred the iPad. And he did not like the uh, Nexus 7, um, mainly because of the uh, soft, to- soft, uh, soft uh, touch buttons at the bottom with the back and home. He would accidentally trigger them all the time because, you know, to him, they're not buttons. Because on the iPad, when you want to go back to the home screen, it's a physical button. You click. And to him, that made a lot more sense. So he would constantly be like, you know, get it with the pad of his hand. He'd hit the back button and dump him out of his game. And that would be frustrating. Now that he's gotten older, he's actually kind of gone back. He dug out my old Samsung Galaxy Tab that runs like Android 2 something. And he's digging on it because of the size. He likes that smaller 7-inch form factor. The iPad's too big for him. So now he's all in on my tab, and I'm like, oh, I kind of wish I had a Nexus for you, boy, because that's old. <laughs> uh, and he loves it. And so a 12-inch. Now here's I'm, – I'm kind of with Seth, though. Like, for me, here's what the iPad is. The iPad is uh, like my Instapaper machine, essentially. Totally. Right? I, I go out on the weekends and or late at night, and I – like, throughout the day when there's just stories that I have to read so that way I can kind of digest them, but I don't have time during the day, I Instapaper them, and then I pull them up, and then – the other thing, the other reason why it works really well for me on the iPad is Instapaper has a dyslexia mode, and it changes the fonts a little bit so that it's easier for me to read and I don't lose my track. And so sometimes when I have a lot to read where it's just nothing but text, I lose my place in the lines and stuff like that. But with the dyslexia mode, I don't lose my place, so I'm able to read much faster. 
And so if I could get that a little bit bigger, I could I think I could that would be even better for me because it's essentially would be almost like a newspaper at that point. Exactly. Yeah, I want I want newspaper. I want newspaper. <laughs> TV Live Leet brings up something very point in the very a very good point in the chat room. They're trying to hit Microsoft in the gut with after the Surface Pro commercial. Oh yeah, yeah, and you know there one of the big one of the big uh, kind of uh, like Microsoft uh, jabs at Apple is oh the iPad's fine if you want to just consume things, but if you want to create content, you need a Surface Pro. Yeah, Open Dyslexic is it? OpenDyslexic.org. You can get it for your computer too, uh, and. Uh, yeah, and you know what? Uh, I will, uh, Andy. I will put a link to that in the show notes for those of you who are listening who might be curious about that because that's I'm actually sure it's in the AUR. Oh, it is. Yeah, I, I remember installing it. I'm pretty sure it's there. That's of awesome. It's in the AUR. See, I don't really. The thing is, the reason why Instapaper works so well for me is I don't really want it on my computer screen because I'm kind of a font bigot. I don't. I. I. The way fonts look matters to me. That's why I also have like the. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, infinality. Yeah, infinality font pack and all that stuff. But Open Dyslexic uh, is great in Instapaper because that's that's my reading space. And the other thing that's nice about it being an Instapaper is the rest of the iPad isn't like that. It's just only an Instapaper. So, and I only really need it when I'm reading a lot of big text. Otherwise, I don't really have a problem. It's just if I'm going to sit down and read for 30 minutes, it starts to become a problem. Yeah, totally. So Open Dyslexic, and that's uh, uh, we'll have a link to that at the bottom of uh, Tech Talk Today show notes. Okay, guys. Well, so next week should be kind of interesting. Not only we're going to have the regular news, but on Thursday we'll have a special live edition uh, covering the, the uh, Apple Keynote uh, Mystery Science uh, 3000 style. I, I hope they have a live stream. If not, we'll make the best of it. We'll do what we do. <laughs> maybe I'll get to be the gumball machine again. Yeah, maybe we'll just have Eric uh, fill time if there's no... Uh, hey, actually, Eric, I'm going to be glad you'll be here because if they stream it and they don't have it in multiple languages at once, you could do one of the languages. Exactly! Just to make sure we have it old school. You know, you can you can do Mandarin, <laughs> right, Eric? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can do... That'll remind us of the last <laughs> keynote. It'll be just like before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. All right, well, uh, Tech Talk Today is live Monday through Thursday over at jblive.tv, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, techtalktoday.reddit.com, techtalktoday.reddit.com, techtalktoday.reddit.com. I did it! Three times fast. That's where you can go to give us story links, your ideas of what should be covered, your insights, and your votes. All of that matters on our subreddit. And you can also go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact to uh, send us in a shout. But really, if you really want to take it up to the pro level, like you want to be a pro level talk, Tech Talk Today commenter, Head over to the live show. You can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get it in your local time zone. Join the mumble room by doing bang mumble in our IRC chat. And then uh, we'll just, uh, Eric or somebody, will double check that your mic's working okay. And then we'll bring you in and you can comment on this stuff as we go. And it'd be great to hear your insights on this because one of the best things about Jupiter Broadcasting is I think we have the smartest audience out there. So I'd love, always love to hear your thoughts. And uh, again, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to find out when we're live in your local time. And don't forget, you can also grab the RSS feed, put it in your favorite podcast catcher, and then you just get this show whenever we're live or whenever we release. And then you don't have to even worry about it. You don't have to worry about that live nonsense. It's on demand, son. Hey, so uh, I, I wasn't sure what we should do for our outro video this week. And we just picked it like literally right before the show started based on a conversation I had with my buddy Chase the other night. Uh, we were driving around and uh, we were talking about computers, old computers, and the old computers that we used to get. And turns out, Mr. Chase Nunes was a gateway guy. He was so big into gateway computers. And I, I, it took me back because I worked at a school district where we deployed a whole series. I believe they were gateway 2000s with, with Windows 95. Um, it wasn't like Windows 95 had like a point release. It was like Windows 95 OE. Or do you guys remember what I'm talking about? Like there was a Windows 95 second edition that added it, USB. It, it was like the service pack almost. Yeah, but it, it was. It, but yeah. it wasn't available to the public. Only right. The OEMs did. Right, and that and these were the gateway. These gateway 2000s shipped with the special version of Windows 95 that added USB support. And I figured out how to take that off there and add it to all the other Windows 95 computers. It was awesome. <laughs> so uh, we'll end up today. We'll wrap today with a gateway 2000 commercial, the all-in computer for just fifteen hundred dollars. Most low-priced computer ads include legal type, like this to let you know about all the wonderful things you won't be getting with your computer. Now this system includes everything you need to get started. Printer, monitor, and software. It's only $14.99 plus shipping and tax. And best of all, it's from Gateway. Gateway computers feature Intel Pentium processors. Call us at 1-800-GATEWAY and we'll build one for you.